This is episode 109 of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. In today's episode, I'll be speaking with Simon P., a friend of mine who I met at the We Agnostics group in Kansas City. Recently, Simon started the Secular AA Speaker Meeting here in KC, which is doing great. In fact, we've turned it into its own podcast. You can listen to those episodes at secularaaspeaker.org or wherever you download your podcast. Hello, I'm here with Simon P., who is from my home group and uh, attends um, secular meetings here in Kansas City, and just thought that we would uh, go through Simon's story and maybe have a little conversation. How are you doing, Simon? Doing well. Thank you, John. I met Simon, I guess, maybe three or four years ago when you started coming to our group? Yeah, I think it was about a year after you guys got started. And then you uh, recently started this uh, speaker meeting, the um, secular speaker meeting, which is going really good. So far, yeah. Yeah, and it's been a lot of fun uh, hanging out with you lately, so I thought it'd be nice to have you over here to um, kind of share your story, because I haven't heard it. I appreciate it. I guess um, I really don't talk about my personal life a ton, kind of on purpose. Um, When we're in groups, I always, I guess when I share, I, I try to think of a way to explain how I've used things I've learned that have helped me. And it often doesn't involve um, going back and remembering the, I don't know, times in my life that I was um, really depressed and far away from what I consider reality at this point. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I guess remembering those times in detail out loud to other people is most sometimes entertaining or fun for me, but, um, it's usually not productive. I, I wasn't doing well then and I didn't have a good perspective on life. So, um, I guess, uh, I'll kind of though at this point start back, um, give you a brief rundown of my youth and what maybe led to drinking and, than what led to me wanting to stop drinking. Uh, when I was uh, really young, alcohol was a big part of my parents' social lives. Um, I was always allowed to drink alcohol, and I wasn't getting drunk at the age of five, but I could have sips from my dad's beer when I was getting it from the fridge. I remember being pretty young and like getting to taste hard liquor for the first time. I think I didn't really enjoy the flavor of liquor at that point. Beer, I did like the smell and the taste of, but uh, it just wasn't a big deal. And everybody who did drink that I was around growing up had a good time, enjoyed themselves. Um, I didn't see the social and um, conflicts that happened within families because of it back then. It just seemed like kind of a party. Um, Then when I was a teenager, maybe 14 or 15, I got drunk for the first time, like swiping beers for my dad. Um, This was all still well and good, though. I remember in... Towards the end of high school, I started, when I would drink, I would drink a lot. And I was kind of known as the guy who could drink a lot. And uh, um, I knew that it took away what I felt to be crippling social anxiety. And I, I wasn't um, unpopular or um, even... Uh, I, like uh I don't know I, I was pretty sociable but I still got nervous when I was talking to people and you know I I was a teenager I had I was still figuring out who who the hell I was um 
and it eased tension, I guess, at that point. But I wasn't uh, doing anything more than, you know, the the random weekend bender or party or whatever. And it was still very social. Uh, I moved away from home. And when I eventually got to the point where I was around people who could get alcohol, I was in situations where I could get it myself. I still wasn't quite 21. Um, I noticed that my drinking ramped way up and I, I had a huge desire to have it regularly. Um, I kind of created, um, just through the friends that I had, the, the things that I enjoyed doing and, uh, the jobs that I had, uh, I created a life for myself where alcohol was always, um, accessible and always, um, acceptable. So I, I could drink all the time. And I often think about what came first. Um, did all of the things that made me want to drink heavily in the end start in my life and never got dealt with and then drinking came along and I don't know, like all, my, my life kind of fell apart in that structure or did I uh, just drink way too much right. for so long <laughs> that it caused me to get really depressed from mm -hmm. just um, being in that, that state for so long. Right. I was for real drunk every single day, most of the day for at least six years. Wow. Um, I, I remember at one point thinking like you've drank every single day for three years. You need to kind of figure out, I don't know, some sort of a system to get this under control. Then about three years later, thinking again, like, oh man, it's been another three years and I, my life has not progressed. And drinking, I guess, um, has progressed. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I was about 26, it started to affect my, um, my social life and I started to hide my drinking and I knew it was a problem. And that's when the physical effects started to take over. Um, I didn't know what to call it back then. In fact, I would say I was a very relaxed person. I, I wasn't anxious, but if I stopped drinking at any point, the overwhelming anxiety, um, made me feel so horrible that no matter how much I didn't want to drink, it was a better option than how I felt. Um, I didn't realize that it was only going to get worse. And the only way out of it was through that misery. You had, you had to go through it at some point. And it just seemed so horrendous every single time. Um, profusely sweating, not sleeping. I had a big fear of not being able to sleep. Um, and not being able to concentrate, just not feeling like myself, not being able to enjoy anything. So I started to fight drinking harder, but I, I didn't stop. Um, I got to a point where I was living in Oregon and my family had to pretty much come get me and bring me back to Kansas City because everything around me was failing. Um, my body, my mind, um, jobs and relationships were starting to crumble. And I got back to Kansas city and was able to isolate more liquor was, um, more accessible here than it was in Oregon in the off hours. It's mm -hmm. a little bit harder to get actual liquor in Oregon. Um, live by a gas station down here in Westport and with my sister and that was a really hard time in my life. I, I had been introduced to AA, um, by my cousin who was an alcoholic who went to unity. Oh. Um, he actually just lived a few blocks from here. Um, and I was fighting very hard against it. 
I didn't like AA. It made me feel uncomfortable. Um, I don't know. I'm going to step aside for a second and say, I, I don't know if, if any of this could have been avoided. I really don't. Um, I don't know if in my life I ever had the, truly had the opportunity to avoid this whole situation. Um, there are even times when I think I sought it out. Um, and I, I, I try to see that in other people and I, I get a, I think a better perspective on how they're dealing with their problems. When I think of it, like they're not responsible for the place they're in. And I wasn't responsible for the place I was in. It was a, a series of a lot of circumstance, maybe biology as well. But, um, for some reason, that was part of my growing up, part of how I got to where I am. And I kind of appreciate the struggle now. Um, going back though, uh, I was living with my sister and th that was very difficult because I knew she was watching me, um, struggle. And I was drinking so much, just very, very dangerous amounts at that point. And, um, working restaurant jobs and just barely surviving. I had to, for my health and my sister's move out of her house and into my parents' house. And I, I kind of got together some dry spells. I was not happy at all, but I'd convinced everybody in my life that AA wasn't right for me. Um, I had grit my teeth and just starting getting bits and pieces of sobriety. I had done a lot of reading. Um, I was fully aware that I was an alcoholic. The first step um, was totally comprehensible and accepted by me. Um, I, I just couldn't stop. Every once in a while, something would happen, a stress in my life that I didn't know how to deal with, and I would end up drinking. And it would spiral quickly out of control, and... Um, there for a while though, I was able to kind of piece together some different pieces of, of, of sobriety. I got better jobs, um, saved up some money and was kind of prospering. And I kind of, I had all my friends back in Oregon and I felt like I needed to get back there and almost proved to myself that I was better. I hadn't really done a lot of healing yet though. So I got back there and, uh, was doing okay. I got a phone call one day that the cousin who had introduced me to AA here had committed suicide. But that, that caused a, a spiral, I suppose. Um, It eventually got to the point again, though, where my friends were calling my parents, um, and they came back to Oregon, and I, I had to get out of there. I, I had to have some sort of a support system put in place. You know what? I don't know. I, I'm, I might have done fine out there eventually, but there were people who did care about me, and they, they were afraid I was going to die. Um, so about a, I spent another year out in Oregon and I came back to Kansas city again and, um, in, I was doing well again. I'd started to go, going to AA unity, um, kind of getting intriculated back into that population. Uh, I didn't really have any friends here, so, uh, and I was still struggling with depression severely. So I fiddled with that. Um, tried having some serious relationships that did not work out. Um, also did a little bit of drinking here and there. Um, for the most part, tried to stay sober and I, and I did a pretty good job. I'd say, I'd say about, um, 80% of the time, 
after I moved back to or from Oregon the second time I, I, I managed to stay fairly sober. Um, when I did drink though, the, the alcohol consumption was, was dangerous. I would drink to get drunk immediately and to turn off completely. Um, that was, that was almost always my, after I started being fearful of drinking and, uh, after I, I didn't want to drink anymore, what I always used alcohol for was to shut off a constant drone in my head. That was my inner dialogue that was constantly spouting unhealthy things um, and worrying about unrealistic things. And uh, I would lay awake at night and just think and drive myself pretty crazy. So I would drink and I could shut that voice off and I could go to sleep and have a part of my day that wasn't high anxiety and very low depression. Um, so I was still dealing with the heavy issues in my life with drinking and it wasn't working. Um, through friends of a friend, somebody mentioned that they we're going to a agnostic AA meeting and I had kind of fizzled out of AA again at that point. I just wasn't super interested. Hadn't found what I was looking for, I suppose. And I started going with my father who had also had a drinking problem and, uh, stopped. I think with, a lot more ease than I did, which was frustrating at times. Um, so we started going and I don't know, I, I really, as far as the, um, secular meetings go, I, I really fell in love with the amount of thought that w went into the reasons why things worked yeah. for people instead of following a set of rules and um, expecting illogical to me, illogical um, things to happen in your life because of following these arbitrary rules. I was able to talk to people about the physiological and psychological um, processes that they went through that made their lives better. Um, I still wasn't done drinking. That was when we met four years ago. Um, I can't tell you exactly why I, I didn't take to not drinking. It took me, so after I, I started trying to not drink, it took me about seven years um, since my last drink now. It was very hard. But uh, I think I finally got to the point where I had seen my life ruined and I mean, like, pre, I don't know, um, I have nothing, no job, no, no friends, like, all the way down to nothing. So many times that I, I guess that was the point. I was willing to do anything. So, Again, I kind of just grit my teeth and, and got through it at the beginning. Um, and again, I had kind of stopped going to AA, but I had 
I had started a relationship with someone who filled a lot of the holes in my life that AA now fills. Um, I guess it was, you know, we, we talked about our feelings a lot and I was able to, uh, and she didn't drink, not because she had a problem with it, but I think just because she could. Um, I'm still learning how to deal with different problems in my life, but for a year when I was, uh, with, with her, uh, I was able to not drink and it, and it got enough time between I had enough experiences, I guess that, and I didn't deal with them that alcohol that, uh, all of that built up and I was able to eventually even just imagine myself not failing. And I was able to, I guess, no, I think that's the best way to put it because I had never, I had never imagined myself not failing. I always thought something would crop up and I would start drinking again and lose everything again. So something happened when you're able to get past that. Well, it wasn't one thing. It was just a lot of things happened. Um, and, and, and some things were hard and some things were easier than I expected, but I just didn't drink. Eventually that relationship kind of dissolved, um, not in a horrible way, but I did know immediately that I was going to have to fill that gap. Um, I still don't. In fact, I don't think most people do well uh, alone with their thoughts all the time. I especially didn't. And so I went back to AA. And I felt immediately relieved. Um, yeah, it seems like when you came back, you got really involved too. Well, I did, I did. And I, I was kind of thinking about that just now. I, I still do get a lot of satisfaction and self-worth from... Uh, thinking I might be able to help another. Sometimes I take that too far. Um, I've even done that in AA recently. But uh, I think that I'm really effective in this environment. Um, not just me, but people who have gone through it, um, seem to, seem to have a lot to say about it. And, um, getting together with a group of like-minded individuals on a regular basis to talk about your feelings and reinforce the things going through your head that you may not see on a day-to-day -day basis working, but if you take a moment to reflect, you think, so you th you th do you think it's, um, do you get the most benefit out of what actually happens in the meeting there at the actual meeting? Or is it like just the, the relationships that you're developing with the people um, that go to the meetings? It's a good question.
I well, I, I have conversations with the people from the meeting. I, I have a lot of friends from the meeting, so I have I have a lot of conversations with people from the meetings who like to talk about, um, I, you know, uh, these things that we talk about in AA outside of the meetings. So there's natural conversation that happens very similar to AA. So I, I'm getting benefits from that, but. Um, I, I think a lot of the thinking I do about sobriety happens in and around the meeting, but I keep returning to the meetings because I have relationships there. Um, but it, it's fun, I think, to watch the pe- people come in because there's been a lot of people come in that weren't coming to the meetings when you, when you were first coming around. It's fun for me to watch those people over time, you know, kind of get themselves together. Yeah. Um, it is. It's really interesting to see the, the waves. Yeah, it is, isn't it? That group has changed personalities over the last four or five years, hasn't it? It sure has. And yeah, I, I guess just you almost don't notice it. Yeah, yeah. It's like very slow, <laughs> gradual. People come and go. <laughs> um, it's. I, I So I, I guess talking about meetings more specifically. Um, well, actually, I, I want to talk about the social aspect real quick. Um, I, pe- I think maybe people with an hour group who know me may think of me as a pretty social person. That is not necessarily the case. <laughs> right. Um, I have a strong tendency to stay home yeah. alone, and now that I enjoy my own company, that's uh-huh. easier. <laughs> but I know that I don't do well alone, and I yeah. work very hard to maintain my relationship right that's something that i um i do despite myself but it it works and it helps um the i was going to kind of dovetail into our meetings um I, I really love the people that we meet with every week and um, I've got a connection there. I don't know though at this point a secular meeting. I, I think if I had to start over in another city and there wasn't one available, it would not be a problem for me. Um, I do feel though right now anyway we are filling a an important place i see people who come in regularly who say that they were specifically looking for an alternative to aa and whether or not aa is supposed to be any certain way there is a general cultural outlook or um view of AA that is religious. And if you see it depicted in pop culture or movies, it's almost always, um, in a scene with a prayer or hand holding or something kind of ritualistic. Um, and times change. And the culture has changed in a way that that's not necessarily how people want to deal with their problems right now. I'm not saying it's, um, religion is bad or good. I'm just saying that there is a gap that needed to be filled and I'm glad that we're there. For yeah. I find it interesting because, you know, when, so our, our our group is like from this long line of groups that st- were started by agnostics and atheists. But anymore, I'm beginning to see people come into the meeting that they don't necessarily identify as atheist, agnostic, or anything. They they don't really, you know. <laughs> I also have noticed over the past year um, the conversation about religion does not – and complaints about 
traditional right yes and i I hate that too right traditional aa doesn't come up right i really didn't like that no me either i don't i don't think that man if you got to get something off your chest in a meeting is a good place to do it um i just don't have a lot of room in my life to be thinking about things to complain right same here and i don't know if spending hour yeah one hour is best used like that well i think it's funny because i think that the group mainly consists of people who probably really weren't going to aa before they came to our group that's one. that's probably one reason you know i would say at least half of the people that i see on a regular basis now have gone to very few if any um meetings outside of so they don't really have a bad experience they don't really have anything to compare it to really yeah and i know we've talked before um about it and you've written a blog about it but um we don't talk a lot about the steps or the traditions or even sponsorship that much i know that that does rub people some people the wrong way um and I do see the benefit of those things, but I see people coming back to the meetings and I see them not drinking. And well, it's kind of funny because I, I, I was having a conversation with um, someone about, about that. And um, I said, but you know what? People are staying sober and they're coming back. And as I really watch what's going on, I see, I see that all this stuff that's happening anyway. I mean, people kind of get curious. What are those steps about? Will you help me? Will you explain this to me? And I'm starting to see it a little bit ha- happen a little bit more. Yeah. Um, it, it is. And, and the people that I am closer friends with within the group have kind of naturally sought it out. I, I think, I think once you start down, down the path of, um, looking inward and changing, it leads you to common questions and solutions. And I've read a lot of self-help books, AA kind of books and Buddhist kind of books and just feel better kind of books. And a lot of them point towards the same forms of therapy for relief. Um, I, I found a lot of relief in, I don't know, uh, the idea of staying focused on the moment. Um, and I guess, you know what? I've gotten the most out of just staying committed to changing and where I see myself lacking in an area, or if I feel myself telling a story to myself about how I am not a way that I want to be, I now actively work against that. I don't know if it's, I just work to change. And I have not thrown away my life for a long enough period now that I see that I can. So I have a theory about these steps. I think that, um, I think all the steps are, are, are a description of what these people went through back in 19, the 1930s. And they were describing it the way that they were experiencing at that time. But all it was, it was, it was what happens naturally when we stop drinking and come together to support each other. Mm -hmm. And that, that if we were to write them out today, it would be pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Very, very similar. (laughs) I think so. Yeah. You, I mean, in a very general sense, I feel the 12 steps, they say, look at your life. See where your problems are. Realize where you can and can't do work on those things. Accept the things you need to. Make changes where you can and be willing to make progress along the way. Um, Maybe help others. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that happening. Yeah. And I just think it's like, well, this is kind of like an organic, just a natural thing. And I think it was back in the thirties too. I think that they had their little group that they went to and everything and they, maybe they were a little bit more dogmatic, but basically it was just what happened when they got together. I think maybe the whole idea of, of looking inward, I don't know if that would have been something that would have come around natural or not, but maybe it does. Cause maybe it is just a natural reaction. Cause I, I think it is when I think about it, because for me, I was kind of shocked that I, that I couldn't admit that I had a problem. 
And so almost immediately I started, I started, I started questioning what the fuck was going on with me, you know? So. (laughs) Yeah, I, I guess through the conversations and the books that I've read, Oh, I don't know. I was gonna. I was kind of thinking about because we were just talking about we were talking about um, how those steps. I kind of think just kind of happen naturally to people as they just kind of get get to um, recover. But um, I thought I would talk about the speaker meeting a little bit because yeah. I got to the point. I've gotten to where that's been like my favorite meeting of the week now. And I've, uh, I, I think early on in my experience in AA, I think I kind of liked speaker meetings. And then I went through a long period of time where I didn't like them. But now I really like them. I, I get a lot of value out of those stories, you know? Um, I do too. I, I guess I, I started the speaker meeting for a multitude of reasons. Uh huh. Um, one, we didn't have an evening weekend meeting. Right. And that's go-to time for you. You hear your friends out doing other things. Yep. You're used to hanging out with that group of people. Um, and we, we didn't have a, a regular speaker meeting mm-hmm. that was really sticking. Mm-hmm. It was kind of half scheduled into mm-hmm. a here and there, but it didn't necessarily ever work out. And I, I liked the idea of, um, somebody sitting down thinking about a message they wanted to convey to a group of people and getting some time to play that out mm-hmm. in the meetings. We often speak from our, our heart at, at our meeting. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of people speaking from their heart and it's spontaneous and mm-hmm. emotional. Um, but it's sometimes, um, kind of leaves you wanting more mm-hmm. or, you know, when it, so sometimes I, I think of things I wanted to say after right. reading and didn't right. get a chance to, right. I, I think they're important. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of change it up too. Mm-hmm. So here we are a few months or yeah, a few months started into in it. November, I think yeah. um, I'm getting a little bit, stressed because I've somehow weaseled somebody to show up every week, but, um, I'm, I'm worried that one week it's just going to be me there and we will be wondering what's going to happen. I guess I get one free pass. I can do it myself. One week. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, it's been exciting and, uh, I've gotten some people from outside of the group. I'd like to do some more of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm willing to kind of see where it leads to. I'm I'm not. Um, stuck it's been in my ways. it's been fun that we've had we've had we have had people from other groups and we've had visitors from out of town too that have come to that meeting. And I don't know if they've yeah. ever been to a meeting like that before. They never they never really say anything like like it like it's different or anything though. You know, they just seem to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've never really gotten a complaint. Well, no. You know what we have? Oh, really? Well, <laughs> there have been a couple surprises. Not in uh-huh. the speaker meeting, but right. in the secular meetings. Right. Surprises when somebody doesn't know we aren't going to do a prayer. Oh, right. <laughs> right. They're, they're really expensive. <laughs> yeah. I always feel really bad at that point because <laughs> I know somebody from our group is going to get pissed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, for the most part, though, I think that we'd be okay with speakers. I hear people say, "Oh, we're going to run out of speakers." I don't know. Well, there's actually a bunch of us that you know in that community. Plus, like you said, reaching out to other people. I like to, the idea of you know getting people from other groups. Yeah i I keep trying to get. I need to do some more legwork myself. My time's thin these days, but. Um, I try to get people scouting out for me if I hear that they're going to other groups, but, uh, um, we'll see. Maybe someday I'll be able to pass the reins off to somebody else and they can figure out what to do for a while. Or maybe I'll have a business meeting one of these days and see what everybody else wants. But it's been really fun and 
it people talk about service work a lot or actually in other groups people talk about service <laughs> right. work a lot we don't really but uh it does really help to plug yourself in and if you want to get comfortable with the community, you got to put the time in yeah. and you, you got to, you got to get some skin in the game. And I don't know. You get a little bit of praise from time to time and, uh, you get to feel like you're a part of something and hopefully you're helping people. Yeah. I like to think so. Uh, so is this how you're dealing, um, like the, the fundamental thing that was kind of driving your drinking was depression, it seemed. Is this how you're dealing with that now? Is there, are you doing anything else for, to, for depression? I, yeah, I do. My entire life consists of tricks I do to deal with depression. That's every single moment of the day, pretty much. And I'm not complaining at all, but if I feel myself, going down a strange path and I'm getting better at identifying those. Um, I got to do something to change it. Um, I still get depressed and I still get anxious, but I, I don't stay there very long now. I notice what's happening and I either, accept the emotions that I can't do anything about for what they are, or I, I take action. Uh, that's a, uh, so I take an antidepressant. Did, did, have you ever thought about that? Or did I did. It, I took anti, I took an anti-anxiety medication or I took gabapentin, which was for anxiety and it worked well for me. Um, it was hard to come off of also, which is not something I was, um, told or aware of, but I think just naturally, if you're taking something that, deals with anxiety or depression for you and you come off of it, you're going to naturally feel those yeah. effects of depression and anxiety yeah. again. And you're not used to them. Right. Um, I, I've, cause I've done that. And, um, cause my doctor has talked to me about maybe going off of it. And, um, my problem was that when I would go off of it, it seemed like I just fell off a, off a ledge. But she said, my problem was that you should never stop it immediately should you need to yeah i you know i and i did not know that i tapered off things um i i also want to be clear i'm not saying that one should try to get off medications right. um that's something um i i thought about for a long time and talked to doctors about before i did um but it it caused other side effects. It does. Everything, uh, everyone, everyone does. It does. And I also, for me, I felt like I needed to be able to take life in yeah. on its terms. Yeah. And I didn't want to filter it out anymore. Um, and I, Honestly, maybe I wasn't clinically depressed. Maybe I didn't have those um, um, chemical imbalances, but I had, I had drank for so long that it, it yeah. mimicked that closely right. enough that it right. could be diagnosed. And I, well, or I did for a period of time right. have those um, symptoms because I, I put myself. Right. There. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, I I decided to quit one day and I did and I didn't taper this last time off medications and I had really bad bad anxiety and I was irritable for a while and um it slowly got better. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's something I want to think about too. I'm like I like you say it's you know you got to talk to your doctor about this kind of stuff, and I do I do talk to her, and I've talked to her a number of times. In fact, she's the one that brings it up about about getting off of it, and you know because I, I might be at a point where I might be able to because what depression I have is probably pretty mild, really. And um, like you, it was um, 
you know, I don't know what came first, if it was that or the drinking or what, but it was, it was all kind of mixed in together. Oh, and yeah, I guess we were talking about what I do. Um, yeah. I have a super physically demanding job. Oh, yeah. And before that, I was doing pretty physically demanding yeah. work, and I didn't have a license for a while because of drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't. So I didn't have my license for a year because of drinking, but mm-hmm. then I just didn't trust myself to get a license for another three years because yep. I, like I said earlier, all I could imagine was me eventually drinking again. Yeah. Um. After that faded, I got my license. Um. So I get a ton of exercise and I can sleep easy. At That's night. great. Um, That's when I don't feel like I'm going to, I take a Benadryl and yeah. I don't, I don't call that what you will, but right. it helps me go to sleep. No, I had a doctor tell me to do that. <laughs> but yeah, that's 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 something I need to do. The ex- exercise def- definitely does help. And uh, I, I, I'm just actively aware of my feelings and thoughts and the situations I'm putting myself into. And if I feel myself slipping so so like before um i when i was taking medication or before i was taking medication when i would get depressed it would send me to um the couch or my bed for a week at a time and i would feel unmotivated to do anything um i still get that feeling but now i just stand up and start doing things yeah. and it does not feel right or comfortable or fun at yep. first but i've done it enough now that i know through my actions i can change my thought patterns yeah yep yeah i had a therapist tell me that he said that that one of the best things for depression is activity and he said that back in like the 40s or the 50s um, when they had we had depressed patients in mental institutions what they would do to help them out they'd have them like scrub the walls and stuff like that any kind of activity seemed seemed to help them out and he'd always tell me he said just go for a walk you know do just move you know force yourself to move so i i'm i'm sure chemically that's that's good too but for me, an action, taking a physical action is sometimes sacred. Yeah. It's it's a way for me to bypass whatever's going on in my head and put myself into a task. And all of my mental problems disappear. I just think about what I'm doing. And... I try to bring that idea and and I think about that a lot into more and more aspects of my life. Um, the hardest place I found that to do is while driving. Um, and I guess that's kind of comical, but it really is one of the only places in my life that I feel truly unhappy and have a really hard time (laughs) getting out of my head is when I'm driving. Right. Um, It's getting better. (laughs) But uh, I, if I find myself thinking about something that's bothering me, it's usually just the thinking Mm -hmm. that's the problem. And if I can stop it, everything else is fine. If I look down at my hands and my feet, I'm almost always in a decent spot. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got all my fingers and toes and I yep. can expect a meal and yep. a place to sleep. Well, I think you're doing great, man. I'm glad that you came back to the group and I'm glad that you started the speaker meeting. Like I say, it's totally is my very favorite meeting of the week. I love all of them. I loved uh, Greg's talk. I'm looking forward to that. Jenny's talk. I mean, all of them have been really, really good. I mean, people have put some thought into what they're going to say, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to the speaker tonight. Uh huh. Um, John B. Okay. Uh, I have been able to kind of cherry pick people so far that I enjoy listening yeah. to. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's one of them. Uh, I try, I, I've, I've been trying to pick people who so far have got more sobriety time than I've got. And, uh, 
I think, do put some thought into what they have to say. Um, <laughs> and if anybody's listening and they feel like I've been discriminated against them for those, those purposes, you're willing to bring that up with me. It's probably not the case. Um, but yeah, I, I do. I, I really, I really enjoy listening to people's stories. And I like also the conversation afterwards. You know, sometimes it's really, really interesting what people have to say. It is. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go through one of the speaker meetings and not pick up on mm -hmm. everything that somebody else picked up on. It expands the conversation. And, uh, I mean, it, it also, it, you, you get to feel like you're getting to know somebody a yeah. little bit too. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, whether it's manufactured or not, it's a real experience. Absolutely. It's a, it's a yep. moment that I get each week that um, brings me closer to other people. Yeah. I'm looking forward to when the weather gets nicer, too, and we can hang out afterwards because it's really been a bitch of a winter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'll am i bet attendance tonight is a little light. Yeah. But yeah. I also bet as soon as it does get nice, everybody comes out of the woodwork. Right. Everybody's been cooped up so yep. much this winter. I think you're right. Yep. Well, I, it was really nice uh, to talk to you like this. It's good to hear your story. I have a lot in common with you, actually. I started off pretty young, all that myself, but um, you, you really have had a hard road, and I'm glad I'm glad you're doing well today, man. I'm glad that you're here. Well, I'm <laughs> I'm especially glad I'm doing well, but uh, I, I'm also glad you're here, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you provided a lot of... of uh, important structure to um the life of recovery mm -hmm. that I, I am leading right now oh great the actions you've taken um well, thank you. we hope we we both continue to help you i do too <laughs> thank you simon <laughs>